Go me! Look at me! As the kids say, thriving. Hi guys, welcome to this episode of How to Lose Your Mind in 72 Hours with June. It's almost Christmas, and therefore, we are doing a Christmas edition of Budget Eats. <laughs> However, it is not any Budget Eats. The theme here today is extravagance. Julia has given me a budget of $100. In exchange for that $100, Julia would like one appetizer, one cocktail, one main, two to three sides, plus a dessert for four people. In case you missed it, I completely lost my mind making Thanksgiving budget eats. Aaron says our walls are sweating, so I can't wait to do it again this time. After all, Christmas is the season in which you eat until you cannot move any longer, fall into a deep slumber, and wake up when it's magically no longer the show of 2020. That's the true gift of the Christmas season. Now, personally, I didn't grow up with a Christmas feast tradition, so I went on my Instagram, I polled all of you, and asked you what defines a Christmas meal for you. And many of you just said family and joining them over food. And what kind of food? Well, there's all kinds of food, it turns out. You guys really go all out, and you go in all directions. And I love that. We have some Chinese food for my Jewish peeps. We have our seven fishes tradition for the Italian families, Filipino lechon and lumpias, Latin American tamales and ponche de frutas, meats of all sorts, bubbling fountains of booze, and mountains of cookies. The theme that tied everyone's responses together was coziness, richness, excess, abundance, luxury, and food comas surrounded by love. Julia has kindly requested that I make a show-stopping piece of some sort as the centerfold of our Christmas experience, to which I thought, duck. I don't like duck that much. It's a little bit too fatty, too flavorful, and just too much. But that precisely is the point of Christmas, isn't it? Of course, Aaron loves duck. That will be my Christmas present to Aaron. I think my goal here with the $100 budget is not to buy more. It's to buy better. If I bought $100 worth of $1 produce and all of my usual budget hacks, I will never be able to finish cooking. I will die on this kitchen floor. Do you want to see that? I don't know. I don't know what you guys are into. Unfortunately, there's no truly ethical consumption in our world, but there are smaller businesses that embody having more ethical and more responsible production practices. So I took a walk to my local farmer's market and I showed up too late. It was 1 p.m. All the meats were sold out, unfortunately. As far as dessert, I also knew that we were going to need chocolate and cocoa powder, and believe it or not, the cocoa industry is pretty messed up too. There's actually a great website that gives you a list of all the chocolate companies that have committed themselves to producing chocolate in a more ethical way by having a more transparent sourcing process. So if you want to check that out, we'll have that link down below in the description box for you. I met up with William from Rocka Chocolate. He gave me this whole stash of chocolate products that were basically scraps that could not be processed further into bars for sale. There's a lot of chocolate. It smells so good. For my remaining produce, I just hit up my local grocery stores. I got a duck, I got some pork belly, I got a bag of salmon scraps for only a buck. Still managed to do budget, even when I'm given $100. I think it's just in my blood, you know? Two main things that I knew I wanted besides the duck and the bouche de Noël was my grandfather's pork belly and potato stew. That is one of my most intense childhood food memories. My grandfather just stewing this soy-based braise to perfection until the pork belly skin was just velvet. And I thought this would be a nice way to remember him. The other thing was the appetizer. I saw the Italian tradition of seven fishes and I thought that would be an amazing appetizer. I'm going to make some homemade crackers and I bought a ton of tinned fish to go with it. Six tinned fishes means I won't have to cook that much for the appetizer. I'll just make the crackers and I'll have my guests, aka Aaron, dig at it and try out all the fishes. So here's everything that I got for a hundred dollars. Merry Christmas. 
from my local farmer's market, I got some eggs, some butter, some Yukon potatoes, and baby purple potatoes, purple onions, garlic, a bunch of scallions, some spearmint for our dessert, some purple cauliflower for our meats. I got a whole duck, head attached. I got skin on pork belly. The skin is super important. It is the best part of pork belly. And if you have not tried pork belly with the skin on, you must try it. I also got some salmon scraps. And then I went ahead and splurged on some cheese. Cheese is always good. We just haven't had cheese yet on this show. Today's the day to try all the things that we've not had money to try. I also got a nice cute bottle of olive oil from Portugal. And for our canned fishes, I got canned eel canned mackerel, canned tuna, canned sardines, canned calamari, canned sprats. I wasn't really crazy about the idea of eating vegetables on Christmas because you know, what's the point? But we will have some. I got English cucumber, I got carrots, I got grape tomatoes, and a little bit of ginger, as well as a Honeycrisp apple, five limes, five lemons, and a whole bag of discounted oranges that don't seem to be doing too good, but we will make do. I also got a pomegranate. I thought that would be really pretty on our bouche de Noël, you know, little berry-like things instead of cranberry. And I got a bottle of Martinelli's sparkling apple cider. I don't drink, Aaron drinks, maybe we'll pop a little alcohol in his serving for him, but for me, sparkling apple juice. In addition, I grabbed a bag of almond flour. I'm going to try to make our desserts gluten-free because believe it or not, I actually am a little bit sensitive to gluten. So I'm gonna try to limit my intake. And finally, for the filling in our bouche de Noël, I grabbed a pint of cream. That brings us to a grand total of 94.54. I didn't even spend all of it, but that's because I got chocolate for free. So, you know, it all balances out. Now let's see what's hiding in my freezer and pantry, shall we? Okay, I think we found some real treasures here. I found two bags. This one is organic sugar and this one is cassava flour. And I believe I took these from the free table back when I was still at the Delish Test Kitchen. We'll use this in our cookies and cakes. This I'm thinking with our cheese, we can turn into a thing that I've always wanted to make that I've never gotten to make. And that's Pau de Quejo. It is a Brazilian bread, I guess. A cheese bread, a gluten-free cheese bread. From my freezer, I found this passion fruit puree. It's so fragrant, I can smell it through the packaging. I think we can melt this down and cook it with some of our oranges and make a syrup for our sparkling apple cider. And the last thing that I'm so excited about is this. This is a bag of sticky purple rice that Lena got me two whole Christmases ago that I've never cooked. So thank you, Lena. I also found this very gross looking sourdough discar. Uh, it's very old. It smells pungent. It looks very questionable. Um, it'll be fine. We'll put it in our crackers. I don't know what to say except I'm overwhelmed already. So let's get started. Day one, here's what we're gonna prep. We gotta prep the duck first. I think we gotta marinate it, maybe like a dry rub type of situation and dry it in the fridge for one to two days. I mean, it's duck. How badly can I f it up? For my duck, we're gonna go ahead and massage the bird. And then after that, we're going to blanch it very quickly in hot water. We're going to pat it dry and then we're gonna coat the inside and outside of the bird with some sugar and salt. After that, we'll make a soy based sauce brush it over and let it hang in the fridge until it's nice and dry. That skin should crisp up in the oven once roasted if we allow it to get dry in the fridge. We're going to bring some water up to a boil. While the water is heating, we're going to set up a little contraption that can hold the duck in the fridge without letting any of the sides touch the pan. I know a lot of you are starting to hit the dislike button because you see a head of a duck attached to the body of a duck that we're about to consume, but if you're gonna eat meat, I think you have to come face to face with the fact that you are eating meat. I think this is a necessary step for me. I cook the duck, I need to, I need to face the duck. Thank you, duck. I'm sorry we killed you. Hi, mom. Uh, I bought a little bit of meat, and that one is also a head. Is it possible to make a head? 
。OK， 那一般怎么做呢？你？一块烤，一块烤 ，OK，OK，、okay. okay, 那我就先连着吧。<笑>那他们他们脚也连着吗？脚也连着呢，但是那个那个支架是不是应该给它剪掉的 ？OK， 好的 ，Thanks, Mom. Mom says I can keep it on. I'm just gonna I'm gonna keep the head on. I'm gonna keep the feetsies on. Or we're gonna roast it. We're gonna see what happens, I guess. How's the duck life? Oh. It's pretty dead. Ooh, the skin is tightening. <gasps> That's so cool. Now what do I do? It's so hot. Is it ready to eat? Oh god. Yeah. Oh god. Oh god. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. I don't know how to do this. I'm just going to go ahead and rinse out our duck with it, so that any impurities can be washed away. A little hot sauna bath. Should we name him? Aaron, do you want to name our duck? Uh, that's kind of sad, dude. She wanted to name our duck. Can you actually come support me right now? It's the first time that I've had to like face an animal, like literally face an animal. Didn't you work on a farm? We didn't kill. I didn't kill birds on the farm. I just. You didn't kill this one. <sighs> yeah, but. I know my mom said I could roast the duck with the feet and the head, but I think I'm gonna chop it off now. I will still cook it, and I will still make the use, the full use out of this duck, but I just, it's a little much right now. I'm going to mentally collect myself for a minute, and then we're going to rub the duck with some salt and sugar inside and out. I'm going with about two tablespoons of each, just gentle massage. One tablespoon on the outside of the bird, one tablespoon each on the inside of the bird. I'm kind of starting to fall in love with this duck. I do feel like I'm developing a relationship with it, even though I murdered it. <sighs> How strange life is. There you go, little guy. You are seeing this in real time. I am way more distressed than I could have anticipated about the duck. And um, we're gonna let that baby rest for an hour and we'll glaze it with our soy mixture. I just... Mm. Dear ducky, I thought you were just food, but even in death, you taught me what it means to feel. There is a lot of feelings right now inside me. I don't even know how to process it. It's a great time to do dishes. Now I'm going to sanitize the crime scene with vinegar. Hope it erases my sinfulness. I think I'm hyperventilating. Okay. <laughs> While we're waiting for this duck to sit in salt and sugar, I think we're gonna go ahead and make some pickles. Because duck tends to be pretty fatty, I think having some carrots, a little bit of onion, and a little bit of cucumber pickled will go very nicely with our roast duck. To really spice things up, I'm going to be putting in one of these spicy hot peppers that Aaron's friend Graz sent us. I think these will make the pickles Aaron style. To make it less spicy, I'm just going to trim off the membranes because that's where the spiciest parts are. In addition, I'm going to be putting in some of this beautiful red onion skin for color. And then we'll just throw in two teaspoons of sugar, a teaspoon of salt, and a little bit of vinegar just enough to come up to about halfway of the vegetables. Going to lit it, we're gonna shake it, and we're going to make sure everyone is happy in there. So the reason why you don't need the vinegar to fill all the way up is because as the veggies sit in it, 
they're going to lose their moisture, the salt's going to pull it out, and then you'll magically have more and more liquid and less and less vegetable volume. So it'll all work out. We're just going to let this sit in the fridge and give it a nice little shake every now and then, and pretty soon it'll be pickles. Remember when I was like, I have so many things stuck in my kitchen that I'd never use? Well, this is one of them. I think I bought this maybe two years ago because I saw it on the shelf at my Chinese supermarket and I was like, that looks cool. Let me bring it home, research, never opened it. But apparently this stuff is what gives a lot of Chinese roast meats and other dishes their red hue. So I think I'm gonna crush about two tablespoons of this and put it in our soy sauce glaze for the duck. For our duck soy glaze, I'm going to eyeball about two tablespoons of soy sauce, one tablespoon of grated ginger, two cloves of grated garlic, two tablespoons of rice wine vinegar, one teaspoon of cooking wine, one tablespoon of my homemade six spice powder, but you can substitute five spice powder, a quarter teaspoon of white pepper, a teaspoon of ground black pepper, two teaspoons of ground chili pepper, and one tablespoon of this ground red rice yeast. It's been an hour, so we're gonna drain our ducky. We're going to wipe him down with a little bit of paper towel action. And once he's all dry, we're going to smear that soy sauce paste on top. He almost looks like he's cooked already, isn't he? Is there space? Is the main issue. Oh, okay. I did it. It's done? We can eat? Yeah, let's eat it. Let's eat ducky. Guys, I'm so exhausted already. But at least the duck is resting. Thank God. Okay, so next up, we're going to make our sourdough cracker dough. I've never made it with almond flour before, so this will be quite a trip. So in a large bowl, I'm going to take some almond flour, some of our cassava flour, a little bit of baking powder, sugar, salt, and about three tablespoons of your choice of seeds or grains. You can put whatever seeds you want in here. I'm going to be going with some sesame and a little bit of flax, you know, for health. And I'm also going to be putting in some crushed fennel as well. I love that savory flavor of fennel. Perfect. We're going to drizzle in some olive oil and we're gonna dump in our sourdough discard. We're going to go ahead and mixy mix this until everything's thoroughly combined and well distributed. Then we'll go in about two tablespoons of olive oil and we're gonna mix that in really well. Once the dough is evenly distributed and it holds shape and it feels a little bit like pie dough, you can go ahead and add in your sourdough starter and your water. Now, I just realized that sourdough starter isn't gluten-free, but I can't let it go to waste. So we're gonna drain off that gross looking liquid and we're gonna use the rest of that starter up. We're going to work that in with our hands until the dough forms. This is what you're looking for. It forms a solid block. It doesn't stick to your hands. It crumbles a little bit, but if you squish it, it holds shape. Put it in a resealable airtight container let it rest in the fridge overnight, and we'll roll it out and bake it tomorrow. We're gonna make some dough. You're going to crack two large eggs and you're going to separate out the whites. Then you're gonna put them in a bowl and whip them until they're soft peaks. Then in another bowl, you're going to combine some almond flour with some sugar. Whenever I'm zesting citrus, I like to hold the microplane this way so that you catch all the zest and you get to observe clearly which parts of the citrus you've already zested. You don't want any of the white parts because that's where the bitterness comes from. We're going to put the zest into our sugar and we're going to rub it into the sugar until the sugar looks like it's very orange. You're going to pour into the egg whites a little bit of almond extract a little bit of orange blossom water, and a little bit of amaretto if you have it. And then you're going to fold the dries into the egg whites until everything is nicely combined, no dry spots remaining. It's going to look and feel a little bit gluey, but that's fine. We're going to let this also sit in the fridge overnight in an airtight container. But we're gonna make one more thing. We're gonna make some gluten-free chocolate chip cookies with our endless rock of chocolate scraps. Do you want a piece with white chocolate? or black. Do you think this would be good in a chocolate chip? It would be incredible, yeah. I cannot cook like this, Aaron. Go we'll get yourself a, a blanket. This gluten-free chocolate chip cookie is actually already on our site, so you can click here.
for the recipe. For this one, we're going to need about three ounces of melted butter along with a quarter cup of brown sugar and a quarter cup of granulated sugar. We're gonna plop in one egg and we're gonna let that all mix together until it's nice and smooth. We're gonna go in with a splash of vanilla extract and then we'll dump in our almond flour along with a little bit of our tapioca starch, AKA cassava flour. We got a quarter teaspoon of baking soda, teaspoon of kosher salt. The best thing about a gluten-free chocolate chip cookie is you don't have to really worry about over mixing because there's no gluten that you can develop in this dough since it's gluten-free. Now that looks like great cookie dough. So we've made two cookie doughs, but I still have about a cup of almond flour left and I would love to use it. I also have those two egg yolks left over and I feel like two cookies isn't quite the right number for a holiday dessert. I feel like you need the magic of threes. So let's make one more cookie. I know that one cookie that Erin really likes is snowball cookies. It's basically a very nutty, ground nut based cookie that's very powdery. It's coated in confectioner sugar. I don't have all purpose flour, but I have almond meal. So in our very dirty cookie dough bowl, I'm going to put some softened butter and some powdered sugar, and I'm just gonna whip it and cream it until it's nice and fluffy. Ooh, that's messy. And then we'll fold in our egg yolks, and then I'll put in a little bit of salt Maybe a little dash of pumpkin pie spice because Erin loves that flavor profile. Ooh, that definitely just went into the salt. What is life? A tablespoon of our cassava flour, a little splash of vanilla, and our remaining almond flour. Tastes pretty good. I'm gonna pack it, we'll bake it, and we'll see how it turns out. Guys, I think it's time to throw in the towel for tonight because I just dumped pumpkin pie spice all over my kosher salt. And this is all the salt that I have in the house. So now the salt is pumpkin pie spice salt. <laughs> Welcome back, it's day two. I'm going to drink some tea and then wake up. All right, I'm ready. We have a lot of things on the agenda for today. We are going to be making our pork belly braise. I'm thinking of putting some potatoes in there, some goodies, we'll wing it. I, mm. And then we're gonna move on to the salmon soup. That should be easy and relatively easy to heat up tomorrow too when we finally eat. Potato salad, I'm going to be making a version of what I remember my mom making for me when I grew up, which always has pieces of apples in it. Then we're going to be prepping our Yule log cake. We're gonna be baking off the cake, we're going to let that cool, we're going to frost it with some whipped cream filling, then we're gonna roll it up, and then we're going to decorate the outside. Nothing's gonna go wrong, of course, in that 80 step process. And then I'm thinking about making a passion fruit syrup for the mocktail because I don't drink, but we'll put in a little alcohol for Aaron. After the passion fruit syrup, I'm going to move on to an orange glaze for the duck and then a tuna salad for our appetizer. And I hope that dog stops barking soon because it's driving me crazy. For our pork belly braise, I'm going to be cubing up all of the pork. My favorite parts of pork belly are these little crunchy bones right here. You let these stew long enough and they turn into delectable crunchy bits. Flavor. And then I'm gonna be blanching those pieces in some hot water. We're going to set the pot with the pork and the water on a medium heat and bring it up to a boil. Once it's at a boil, we're gonna turn the heat off immediately and drain off the water. It's a trick that I learned from my Asian mother and she told me this gets rid of all the impurities and you know, just the not so fresh tasting bits of the meat. After it's been blanched, I'm gonna put those pork cubes in my cast iron Dutch oven because this is gonna be a big long stew. I'm going to be putting in half of an apple, diced. When I peel apples, I like to preserve the peel, I think. The peel has most of that apple flavor concentrated in it. I'm gonna go ahead and use two different soy sauces here. One is a little bit fresher, lighter, your average soy sauce that you usually get. And this one I found a couple of weeks ago, mushroom soy sauce. It's got a little bit of like wise dinosaur taste to it. Does that make sense? 
along with some mirin and water. With that, I'm going to add in some aromatics, ginger, some garlic, as well as white pepper, black pepper, citron peppercorns, and two star anise and cinnamon stick, fennel seeds, another teaspoon of our red yeast rice powder. After all of that is commingled and nicely distributed, we're going to be adding in a pound of our potatoes, peeled, cubed. When it comes to potato sizes, it really does not matter. The more variation you have, the more variation in texture you have when you finally get to eat it so that some pieces are creamier and some pieces are slightly more solid. And it's just all good, you know? I love diversity. My grandfather used, my grandfather used to, oh my God, this car outside. Yes, yes, sir. I remember eating this dish as a kid and just remembering how silky the pork tasted. My grandfather would basically let this cook and simmer until all the potatoes became part of the broth and the meat relinquished its essence into the broth as well. And then the broth turned into the sauce that just coated every single bite and everything became one. So after about an hour and 20 minutes of cooking, the pork belly stew is perfect. The potatoes are tender and creamy. The pork is falling apart. I'm going to keep the lid off and I'm gonna let the sauce reduce until it gets a little bit stickier, a little bit more bodacious. For the salmon, we're going to do the same blanching process because I got salmon scraps. They're probably not high quality. They might not be that fresh. Once our salmon is blanched, I'm going to go into the pot with some olive oil, a little bit of garlic, a little bit of ginger. The ginger helps wick away any remaining fishiness and it gives you that nice, clean, healthful, fresh taste. We're going to let those aromatics toast for maybe 30 seconds, one minute, and then we're gonna go in with some halved grape tomatoes. I'm hoping that this will give it some sweetness, some acidity, some nice body to the soup. Then we'll add our salt, salmon, white pepper, black pepper, and we'll just let it stew away until it smells fragrant and looks milky. The broth should turn this slightly opaque color. That's when you know flavor is all in. After about 25 minutes, our fish stew is done. I'm going to take it off the heat, set it off to the side. I'm going to go ahead and start prepping our potato salad. I'm going to rinse them really well because I'm going to keep the skin on and then I'm going to cube them. When it comes to cutting these baby potatoes up, size does matter. I want them to cook at the same rate so that they're the same texture inside the salad. These are freaking gorgeous. I'm going to blanch them in water until they're very, very tender. I don't want them quite falling apart, but just on the edge of like completely disintegrating because I like my potato salad with no crunch from the potatoes themselves. I like my baby food textures and this is how smushy I like my potato salad potatoes to be. Very mush, very creamy, very hot, hot, hot. We're gonna chop some carrots, chop some onions, chop some apples, throw it in with our potatoes, and then we're gonna make a mayo vinaigrette. To make our mayo dressing, I'm going to take mayo and combine it with one chopped anchovy filet. I know a lot of you aren't into the fishy taste, but try it, try it once, try it once. And we're going to whisk it with some lemon juice, a teaspoon of sugar, a little salt, a little pepper. And I think for Aaron's sake, maybe we'll just add in a little bit of chili in some form, huh? How's your life going, Jude? Oh, you know, mayo everywhere. It's beauteous. We're gonna slap a lid on this, let it rest in the fridge overnight, and then come back to it and eat it tomorrow when it's even better. Oh, I need a bigger fridge. Okay, I was gonna start on the Bouche de Noel, and then I remembered, do you recall yesterday, at the end of my very long day, I said, hey guys, we have a cup of almond flour left. Let's make some cookies with it. That was supposed to be for the Bouche de Noel cake. <laughs> However, I do still have cassava flour left, so I think I'm going to be using that instead. I could use all-purpose flour as the original recipe calls for, but what's the fun in that? Might as well try something new, and if it fails, then we learn something. The Yule log that I'll be making today is based off of a awesome recipe by Mackenzie. So if you wanna make a tried and true one and not an experimental one with cassava flour, click here. 
we have the recipe for you. For the first part of this dessert, we're gonna bake the cake. We're gonna take our eggs, we're gonna separate the egg yolks from the egg whites. For reference, all of the eggs that I'm using are about 55 grams or so. Your eggs may vary, so if you are a stickler for numbers, 55 grams per egg is what I'm using. We're going to beat them separately and then we're gonna fold them together to make this genoise cake. A quarter cup of sugar is going into the egg whites and a half cup is going into the egg yolks. If you're baking at home and you only have one hand mixer and you don't feel like doing a washing in between, I'd recommend that you whip up your egg whites first and then move on to the egg yolks. That way you don't contaminate the egg whites with fat from the egg yolks. This is exactly what you're looking for. You wanna see that it's holding a ribbon shape for at least two to three seconds once it falls into the bowl. Cocoa powder, peppermint salt, set aside. We're going to be pouring the egg yolk mixture into the flour first and folding it in very gently. Turn your bowl as you go, under, over. Once all of your dries are mostly incorporated, we're gonna go in with one batch of our egg whites. We're going to add the egg whites in batches. This way you don't deflate all of the fluffy egg whites with this heavy, dense, floury mixture. When you go in with your second batch of egg whites, just be very gentle. This is the point at which you don't want to deflate your batter. It should be nice and silky smooth, but still fluffy, almost like mousse. Once it's on the tray, even it out and push it to the ends of your baking sheet, but don't go too crazy because you don't want to deflate all those nice little foamy air bubbles that will keep your cake afloat. Middle rack, about 10 to 12 minutes, maybe 15. I think I had like two pieces of chocolate for breakfast, so I'm ready for a snack. Let's make those potato chips. Very simple. On a sheet tray, I'm gonna dump out all of our potato peels. I'm gonna toss them in a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of salt, a little bit of chopped masala and black pepper, and then we'll let it roast when the cake comes out until it's nice and crispy. If your cake is already releasing itself from the sides, that's a good sign. We're going to touch the surface of the cake to see if it has a slight bounce back effect. If it bounces back a little, you're good to go. We're going to let it cool off for about three minutes and then we're gonna run an offset spatula around the edges of the pan to fully release the cake. Then we're going to dust the top of the cake with some powdered sugar, invert a tray on top of that, flip it, release the parchment paper, dust the parchment paper with some powdered sugar as well and then we're going to flip that cake back onto the parchment and roll that parchment up. This rolling process will help you prevent having cracks later on in the cake. Hopefully, I do not make a big mess in my kitchen while doing this because it can't be messy. The golden window for rolling this cake up is within seven minutes of coming out of the oven. Once you have it rolled up like this, let it rest seam side down on your tray until completely cool. In the meantime, we'll make our whipped cream. Fun fact, this is my favorite part of any cake making process. That little bit that gets stuck to your pan that has all of the oils that you sprayed the pan with. It's delicious. Potato chips, yeah. you say? Mm -hmm. These almost look like potato skins. They are potato skins. So they're potato skin chips. Yeah. Do you know that I love skin of anything? Duck skin, pig skin, potato skin, Well, you were chicken getting skin, all three. June skin. Ew. <laughs> oh my God. What do you, what? They're so good. I think they taste pretty good, but they're like really astringent. Yes. In my throat. And I don't it's know if I weird. like that. Very unusual. All right, well, you can eat or dump. I don't know if we're rating those chips, but if we are rating those chips, they only get a five out of 10 for me. The raspiness in my throat after eating them, the astringency is very strange. Not sure if worth it, but the texture, perfect. All right, on to the next portion of our bouche de Noël, which is the whipped cream filling. This is very straightforward. Just whipped cream, 
powdered sugar, a little bit of peppermint extract, and a little bit of gelatin. Now, if you're making this a day ahead, you want the gelatin in there so that the whipped cream doesn't start weeping. Sometimes whipped cream weeps if you leave it alone. Whipped cream too feels alone and lonely. I'll also add a pinch of our peppermint salt in there just to give it a little oomph. At the beginning of quarantine, I had to develop a homemade marshmallows recipe and the only store that had gelatin had it in these bulk boxes. So I still have 30 envelopes in here. I'm gonna take one of them. I'm going to bloom it in a little bit of water, two teaspoons of gelatin to two tablespoons of cold water. After five minutes, it's gonna look like this and then we're going to microwave it for five to 10 seconds until it all melts into one liquid form. The goal here is not to cook it, it's just to melt it. So do not let it boil. Everything should be clear. There should be no clumps in there. And if there are any clumps at this point, just strain it out. Once your whipped cream is at a soft peak, stream in your gelatin and keep whipping as you're streaming. This way the gelatin won't set into clumps as it whips around the whipped cream. You'll notice that once you stream the gelatin in, this whipped cream sets very fast. Aaron, do you want to taste some whipped cream? You know my answer. Mm. Whenever you ask me if I want to taste this something. This is so good. Is it pepperminty enough? Mm. I could go a little heavier on the peppermint, actually. Oh but my god. It also needs some chili. You have no taste buds. Go away. <laughs> go. For the record, I think this tastes amazing. I'm going to set this bowl of deliciousness in the fridge to let it chill down a little bit and then we'll frost our cake once that's cool too. Next up, as the sun sets down on us, let's make some passion fruit syrup for our mocktail. I'm going to be using half a packet of this plus the zest and juice of a couple of oranges as well as our apple peel from earlier and I also found some frozen cranberries left over from our Thanksgiving challenge. With our remaining oranges, I'm gonna go ahead and make an orange sauce for our duck. So I'm just going to juice our remaining oranges. And then in our pot, we're also gonna put in some sugar, some soy sauce, as well as a piece of ginger sliced, two star anise, one quarter teaspoon of white pepper. This is the orange sauce with a lot of orange juice. Your videos are going to be more or less successful when everybody gets the vaccine and the world goes back to normal. Less, obviously. Mm -hmm. This is the relatable content. Are you afraid of that? No, because my work does not represent me. This is our cran apple orange passion fruit syrup slash jam, and I'm just going to lit it and we'll keep it in the fridge until tomorrow. Ooh. It is incredibly tart, but would go great with the Martinelli's. Our soy orange sauce has reduced nicely. We're going to strain it and put it in a jar as well. Okay, I think we're finally ready to frost our cake. The whipped cream is chilled, the cake is chilled. Let's roll. make it more Christmassy, I'm going to be putting chopped chocolate inside of our whipped cream for a stracciatella look. Then we're gonna roll it up using the parchment as tightly as we can. I'm going to transfer that to the fridge and let it set for another hour before we can decorate it. Next, I'm going to mix our tuna salad for tomorrow. That way it can sit overnight because tuna salad always tastes better the day after. The tuna is gonna be a very simple recipe. We're just gonna drain that can of tuna, mix it with some mayo, put some of our quick pickles from yesterday in along with a little bit of sugar. And it's not really a tuna salad until I have a little bit of cracked black pepper in there, so that's gonna go in as well. Well, at least that one was easy. Hang on tight, we're almost there. <laughs> to make sure that tomorrow goes as smoothly as possible, I am going to make the pau de queijo dough right now so that all day tomorrow we will just be baking, 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 baking. I'm super excited to see how this one will turn out because I've never made this before, but I love eating it. It's a chewy, cheesy gougere of sorts. It's like a puffy cheese bread. What's not to like? 
So basically, in a pot, we're gonna bring together some cream, some water, some butter, some olive oil, and then they're all gonna come up to a simmer. Once that is hot and boiling, we're going to pour it into a bowl with salt and our cassava flour. We're going to let that come together and we're going to let it mix, mix, mix until it's nice and smooth and a little bit cooled down. At which point we will crack in two eggs, one at a time, until that dough looks nice and silky. All right, well that's obviously not gonna work. Aaron, my Jim. hands are really gross. Can you, um, can you put some black pepper in here? Keep going. Yeah, buddy. And because it's cheese bread, we gotta have a lot of cheese. About a cup and a half or two cups of both of these. This one smells like a waxy pecorino parmesan mix and aged gouda just smells amazing all the time. You really can never have too much cheese, you know? And to make it extra celebratory, I'm going to be using some of this truffle salt inside our pau de queijo. So cheesy! I don't know why I keep lying to myself. I've been saying I'm so close for two hours now, but we only have one more thing to do for tonight, and that is to frost our bouche de Noël. So we only have a little bit of butter and we have a tiny bit of cream left, not enough to make a buttercream frosting as the original recipe dictates. However, we do have a crap ton of chocolate thanks to William. So I'm thinking we melt some chocolate. I like to take the chocolate out when there's still chunks in there because the vessel itself is very hot. So the carryover heat will continue to melt the chocolate as long as you keep stirring. So just keep stirring. It'll get smooth eventually. Oh my God, this is we plop the butter in, let it cool down a little bit, and then we stream in the whipped cream for a slightly whipped ganache frosting. How does that sound? Sounds great to me. Let's do it. If you ever notice that your chocolate looks a little bit broken, just add in a little bit more cream. Unfortunately, I'm mostly out, but that should help a little bit. We're gonna trim off the ends so that we have nice, even slices tomorrow. Also an excuse for me to eat this right now. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. All right guys, uh, it's 7.51 p.m. I think I'm done coating my bouche de noel in ganache and I think I'm going to go crash forever. I'll see you guys tomorrow. <laughs> Some of the lights that I taped up are starting to fall apart and I feel that. I don't know how we're gonna get through this, but we will. Here's what we got. We're gonna roast the cauliflower and prep them for frying later. I think fried cauliflower is one of the most delicious things. Then we're going to portion and bake the crackers. We're going to portion and bake the cookies. And then we're going to bake the pao de queijo. I'm also thinking of flattening some of them into a tortilla shape and making them as a stovetop pancake. Experimental time. We'll see what happens. After that, we're going to roast the ducks with the cauliflower greens stuffed inside. I think that will make a delicious vegetable side and we won't have to toss away the cauliflower greens. Then I'm going to steam some rice, that rice that Lena gave me two Christmases ago. I soaked some of that in water last night, hoping to just put it on the stove and it'll cook itself. We're going to cut up some crudite with our leftover vegetables, some tomatoes, cucumbers, carrots, onions, maybe a little bit of cauliflower too. After that, we'll reheat everything. And then we'll make our mocktail while decorating our bouche de Noël. 
and then we'll eat and then I will just collapse. Oh my God, collapsing sounds great. Some days you just don't feel like doing anything and today is one of those days. Still gotta do it. For our beautiful cauliflower, I'm just going to preheat my oven to 375. I'm going to chop them into florets, toss them in a little bit of olive oil, salt, pepper, and additional spices of your choice. And then we're just gonna let them roast until they're mostly tender, but not completely soft because we're gonna be coating them in a slurry later and frying them. For our greens, I'm going to peel the stem of the cauliflower, chop it into small pieces, and combine that with the chopped greens. So for my greens, I'm going to pick through the leaves. If any of them look too damaged, I'm going to toss those bits away. And because these leaves can be quite tough, I like to slice them down the middle, have the stems, so that they're easier to break down and chew later on. Then I like to stack everything, roll them up, and sliver them into thin slices. This way they can cook much faster and they won't be laborious to chew through. We're going to add a little bit of onions, a little bit of garlic, a little salt, a little pepper, and then I went ahead and mixed in some of the pork stew into the greens. Kind of like a uh, slightly five spiced collard greens experience. I'm going to throw that on a sheet tray and let it bake in the oven so that it wilts a little bit and we can stuff it all into the small duck. The duck was small to begin with, it got even smaller in the last two days. 25 minutes at 375 and this is exactly what I'm looking for. A nice crunchy tenderness and lots of little golden bits. And we do like our golden bits. On our collards, I'm going to go with a little bit of sriracha and a little bit of hoisin. Next up, for our crackers, we're going to use what remains of our cassava flour, dust our board with it, roll out the cracker dough to about an eighth of an inch to a quarter inch thick. I like to use my bench scraper to make sure that the edges are as even as they can so that you get nice little slices. This also helps you compact the dough more efficiently. Then we're gonna slice them into your desired shapes. No surprise here, I think this dough definitely works better with all-purpose flour rather than almond flour. Almond flour has no gluten, it has no pull, and it's a lot more crumbly. However, through sheer persistence and willpower, I believe you can do it. Lay them out on a baking sheet and bake at 350 for about 12 to 15 minutes, depending on how soft or crisp you like it. If you want a little bit more flavor, brush the top of the crackers before baking with a little bit of olive oil and then top with some additional spices if you so desire. Usually when I'm using all-purpose flour in these crackers, they take about 16 to 18 minutes. However, because of the high fat content in almond flour, these only took about 12 minutes. So if you're using a nut-based flour for these, keep an eye on them, check in at eight or 10 minutes to see how they're browning. And also because of all of my chaotic energy, I forgot to put salt on top before baking, so we're gonna put it on right after. I'm also going to bring out our duck so that it comes to room temperature before we roast it. This ensures even cooking, you know, no burnt skin, no raw insides, all even, all good. For the Emiretti cookie, I'm going to portion them one tablespoonfuls of rounded balls of dough, and then I'm gonna roll some of them in organic sugar and some of them I'm just gonna leave plain. Three twenty-five for about 20 to 25 minutes until they're nicely golden on the outside. So if you're like me and you only have a few sheet trays around and you're handling a big baking project like this, never ever ever portion your cookies onto a hot tray because that will cause the bottoms to cook prematurely and it will lead to burning. Instead, what you can do is peel off your parchment paper, use a towel, take the tray, and rinse it in the sink with cold water. You get to cool it off, and then you dry it off, and then you can bake another tray of cookies in like two minutes. Easy. 
Now, when it comes to parchment, I reuse mine over and over and over again until it becomes burnt and crinkly and no longer of use. There's no need to throw it out after one time. For our snowball cookies, I'm going to portion them the same way we did the Amaretti, and they're gonna bake at 350 for about 15 minutes. After they're out, just until they're cool enough to handle but still very warm, we're gonna roll them in some powdered sugar for that snowball effect. If you're doing this right and the snowball is still hot, you can see that the powdered sugar sinks in a little bit. You can always go back in for a second dip if the sugar disappears. Then you have a truly sugar bomb. For our gluten-free chocolate chip cookie, we're going to portion the dough about a tablespoon and a half per ball, and then we're going to flatten it just a tiny bit to help it spread, and then we're going to stick it with more chocolate because I have so much chocolate. Aaron also likes a little bit of salt on top of his cookies, so we're gonna sprinkle some of that on, and then we're gonna bake it at 375 for about 12 minutes. I like doing this so that it compresses the cookie, squishes out all of the excess air that blew up during the baking process, and gives you a much chewier end product. I think I deserve a cookie, y'all. It's gonna be a long day. I roasted the cauliflower greens until they were pretty crunchy and crispy, almost like roasted Brussels sprouts. I wanted to concentrate the flavor of the greens as much as possible and also remove as much of the moisture as possible so that it doesn't have to like moisten the duck skin once it goes into the duck. Also just makes for great snacking. It's getting, it's getting so hot in here. Pau de Quejo. We're gonna turn our ovens up to 400 degrees. We're going to scoop them out on our sheet tray, spaced apart about two inches. If you ever find that the dough is too sticky to handle, just dampen your hands, it will release perfectly. And then we're gonna bake them for about 20 to 25 minutes until they turn a nice, even golden color. Since it's my first time baking it, I'm gonna check in at about 10 or 12 minutes, see how it is, turn a halfway. Hopefully it's beautiful. <sighs> These flat pau de queijo look very promising. Taking the pau de queijo out, ooh, they look nice and golden. Man, I really wish you could smell this because it smells like amazing. soft, it's warm, it's chewy, it's cheesy, it's perfectly toasty. Next up, we are gonna prep our ducky friend. I've no doubt that if I were to leave that rub on during the bake, it would all burn. So what I'm gonna do is take a paper towel, dampen it, and we're going to do our best to gently wipe it all off without getting the skin soggy or too wet again. So for our duck, I'm going to clip off the neck and then I'm going to put its feetsies and the neck inside the carcass along with our stuffing so that they can all cook together without burning too much. To prevent the skin of the duck from sticking to my rack, I put a piece of our leftover parchment from our cookie bake on top and then I slivered it with a knife. That way the fat has somewhere to drain, but the parchment will protect the metal from sticking to the skin of the bird. I tied up the legs so that they weren't too far apart, but still enough so that all of the leg could get exposure to the oven heat. And then I tucked the fat from the tail over them to protect them from overheating and burning. For the wings, I clipped off the tips. I put that inside the carcass as well. I used toothpicks to secure the loose skin flaps as well as the wings and the legs so that they get a little bit more pinned to the body and don't come loose during the bake. And I said I was going to cook the head of the duck, so I did. But I know you guys didn't want to see it, so I put the head of a duck in some parchment with a little bit of soy sauce and a little bit of mirin, and then I salted it just a tiny touch and it's gonna roast in there. And then I'll eat it and you'll never know what it tastes like. Do you hear this? It's not even like five minutes into the bake yet, and it's already fat sizzling everywhere. I don't want to clean this up. As the duck continues to intimidate me from the comfort of the oven, I'm going to be working on a crudite platter where I just cut up all of our remaining veggies, and then I'm going to be steaming some of Lena's rice, and we'll heat up all of our stews and soups from yesterday. Whenever I make any form of glutinous or sticky rice, I like to rinse it, put it in a strainer, put the strainer over a pot of boiling water and literally just steam it. There's no water touching the actual rice. It's gonna go for about 20 minutes. 
I'm going to spoon off some of the fat that's on the tray. I hope you like duck fat, Aaron. After about an hour and a half at 350 degrees, the duck is fully cooked. At this point, I'm just going to turn the oven up to 400 degrees and let it blast for about five to 10 minutes until the skin is nice and crispy. The only thing that's left for me to cook now is the fried cauliflower. I'm trying very hard to be enthusiastic right now, but like, this is just too much cooking for one person, y'all. To make our fried cauliflower, I'm going to add our remaining cassava flour to a large bowl and then I'm gonna go in with half a teaspoon of baking powder, salt, black pepper, and nala karam, as well as a little bit of MSG. You know I love my MSG. A little bit of water. Then we're going to toss in our cauliflower, coat it until it's all evenly coated. To avoid getting burnt duck bits in our cauliflower, I'm just going to strain the oil into the pot. We're gonna let everything get nice and fried and crispy and golden and delicious. The golden rule of frying is that if you see the bubbles start getting less and less vigorous, it's time to fish your things out of the pot. Because I don't have enough duck oil, I'm tilting my pan so that all of the oil drains to one side. And this also gives you a clearance where you can shift your done fried items to one side of the pan and let it drain. Guys, let's do something crazy. I still have a lot of duck fat in the pan. Let's fry our sticky rice. On top of the fried black rice, we're gonna put a little bit more of that Indian spice mix, and then we're gonna give it a nice little toss with the spoon. We're gonna decorate our bouche de Noel, but first we need a pomegranate. This was taught to me by my ex pastry chef, Diana. She taught me a lot of things, but basically you make a square cut and then you use your thumb against the stem to push this bit out. You take each of the vertices and you make that diagonal slash so that you create a point at which you can basically petal the pomegranate out. There we go. To decorate our bouche de noel, I'm just going to put some sprigs of spearmint around it and some pomegranate seeds, some powdered sugar on top for that little holiday wintry forest look. What's a snowy Christmas song? Snow bells jingling in snow time, ringling snow outside. While it's snowing, look at the snow go. If anyone wants to give us voice lessons, hit us up in the comments. Aaron, are you ready to eat all of this? <laughs> yeah, I think I've eaten two bites of cookie today, and it's uh, almost five, so yeah, I'd say I'm ready to eat. There are a lot of things to eat. Let me show you all that we have cooked over the past three days. Is this enough for $100, Julia? Is it? All right, lovely Aaron is going to narrate for us all the courses that we have. But first, a drink. Okay, Aaron, what is our cocktail mocktail of the day? Uh, it says sparkling apple cider mint julep with passion fruit syrup and a splash of alcohol for Aaron. Aaron. Okay, so funny thing is I've never had a mint julep, but I know it has mint in it and a little bit of rum and a little bit of sugar. So we're gonna take a jar. We're gonna put some mint down in the bottom of the jar and then we're gonna smash it. We're gonna put our puree down the middle and we're gonna smash that in too. And then we're going to and then we're gonna pour some apple cider in there and we're gonna give it a little swishy swish. Y'all, I've been cooking way too long. Just give me my drink. Yeah, the menu says splash of alcohol for Aaron, but are you sure you don't need one? I just... Ooh, this smells nice. Did you invent apple cider mint julep? I don't know, did I? Happy holidays, June. All right, chef, ratings on the cocktail mocktail? It's some of my first calories of the day, so 10 out of 10. <laughs> this is the way to do it. You starve him. Yeah. You starve him. <laughs> it's really great. I usually go for whiskey, heavy cocktails, you know, stuff with bitters, brown liquids. Well, this is brown of its own sort. Not too much sweet, fruity stuff, but this is great. I like Very eating refreshing. the mint. Yeah, of course you would eat the veg out of a cocktail. All right, now we're going to have Aaron read the menu. So... 
Let's take a look at our nine courses. Our mocktail cocktail. Sparkling apple cider mint julep with passion fruit syrup. Pau de kale. Ooh. Canned seven fishes, tuna salad, potato salad, crackers, and crudite. Roast Peking duck with cauliflower greens, stuffing, pickles, and orange sauce. Mm. I put one of Graz's peppers in this pickle. So you're trying to kill us? Yes. This is tomato salmon soup. Grand Paz five spice pork belly and potato braise with glutinous sticky rice. I have one bowl of steamed black glutinous rice, and then I have one bowl of fried glutinous black rice. Fried in what, June? Duck fat. Duck fat. The finest fat of all. Duck fat fried cauliflower bites. Chocolate peppermint yule log using cassava flour, stracciatella whipped cream, and ganache frosting. Just so you guys know, it is pitch black outside right now. These are assorted cookies, including almond chocolate chip, pumpkin spice snowball cookies, and orange blossom and already. Hold that. Holding. Do I know how to cut it? No. Am I going to cut it? Yes. Let's get some stuffing in there. <laughs> Which side are you going for? Oh, wings. You're just tearing. Oh my god. Aaron, what the f are you, you doing? You suggested this yesterday. Don't pretend you didn't say, let's just tear our wing off and eat it. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Easier than I thought. Very nice. Should I take a bite? Take a bite. Just like that? Just like that. Do it. But it's been weeks you've been making this meal and I just bite it. Let's do it. Oh, mm. oh sweet sustenance. <laughs> so most family holiday meals are like around a table, you know. Pass the salt, please. Please, sir. Mm, oh my God. May I have the salt shaker? Mm, but here yum. we are standing in the kitchen. Tearing into a duck wing. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Duck. I'm Thank sorry, you. you're, you're so delicious. Huge disclaimer is that this is not Peking duck, okay? This is not Beijing Kaoya at all. There's no skin, crispiness, none of that, but it is a delicious duck nonetheless. Is that the famed grass chili right there? It is. Jesus. Mmm. That's way more tender than I was expecting. What you do you cooked mean? this perfectly. I did? Mm hmm. Ooh, yeah, I love that. Mm. I thought I loved the wing, but. Man. After all this work, I'm gonna give myself a 10 out of 10 on this duck. It's freaking yeah. fantastic. This whole this whole thing here, mm -hmm. there's a 10 bowl right here. You like the stuffing? Yeah. I like everything. Go me! Look at me! As the kids say, thriving. The meat of the duck isn't so moist that it's like juicy, but it's just moist enough that it's soft and it's very pleasing to bite into. Then you pair it with the clean and crisp scallion and cucumbers. It wicks away all the fattiness of the duck and it just leaves you with a very satisfying bite that's both savory and sweet. That's a lot of words to say. It's good. I think these pickles are part of the reason why Aaron gave me a 10 out of 10 because he finally got his spicy on the first go around. Thanks, Graz. Do you think my haters want to see me eat this? Yeah. Want to see me get punished? This is for all the haters. Enjoy. Oh, it's not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, a lot of the heat... Okay. I was going to say a lot of the heat got seeped into the rest of the uh, pickles, but uh, I'm feeling it. What's our next course? Padikejo. We have the traditional one that's in this little pocket ball form, and then I made like this pancake thing that's kind of cold and dry now, but... It's still good. Yeah, cheesy. Mmm, -hmm. it's so good. Oh my god. I've only had Padikeo a few times. This is the best one I've had. Woo! I have like three. So. It's still first place out of three. It's first place, yeah. I'm gonna give myself an 8.7 on that one. I don't know. I'm trying to find ways to not give you a 10, but it's like, this is exactly what I want from Pat. I would say, I guess the only thing I can think of is. It's not like a shoe pastry inside, you know? Oh. It's not a hole inside. Gotcha. It's just, yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit dense. I was hoping that it would uh, have a little more aeration inside, but mm -hmm. it's not like bready. But I think a proper pot de queijo should be like a shoe pastry with a big pocket inside. But other than that little technical detail, it tastes amazing. What's your grade, Jeff? Boop. That's not a number. Yeah, it is. Aaron's not giving me a grade, so we're gonna go with mine. 8.7.
Yes. After only a six hour break lying in bed and moaning, I've recovered <laughs> from the chili <laughs> and I'm ready to try the soup. Let's try the soup. Please, sir, may Why I did you choose soup? the smallest? Oh my God. Because we have an, an incredible amount of food. Did you see all this? Are there bones in the salmon? There might be. This is a scrap bag, so. That was my eyeball. It got straight in your eye? Uh huh. Of course it did. I know good broth when I see it. Did you see it? I saw it. I'm kind of used to this kind of soup being chicken mm -hmm. soup. And I've had this as a Chinese dish before, but it's still kind of hard to get over the expectation that it's going to be chicken soup and then that fish flavor hits. Mm. For me, the soup is an 8.5 out of 10 because I grew up eating it and it tastes exactly like I'm used to it tasting. What do you give it, Aaron? I'm going to give it an objective grade of nine and a personal grade of six. Okay. I don't know what to do with that. I think if you used your incredible chef talents to make this as a chicken soup instead, this would be the most hearty, heartwarming, curative chicken soup ever. But it's not a chicken soup. It is what it is. I say it's pretty good. If you like that fishy richness, then this is your- 7.5 if you have it to personal and objective. Okay. Aaron gives it a 7.5. And I think it's pretty good. So, and it only cost me like a dollar and a half. So, mm. Fried cauliflower. These are obviously not crispy crunchy anymore, but there are some crispy bits. I wish that the slurry was a little bit thicker so then it could have gotten crispier, but it didn't. And now we have just duck fat confit cauliflower. It's not bad, it's cauliflower. It's nice having some proper veg in the meal. Mm-hmm. It's just sort of like, I'm looking at all this delicious fat over here, you know? Mm-hmm. Why would I want to eat vegetables covered in fat when I could eat fat covered in fat? Moderation? Balance? Uh, I don't know. Variety? No, I get out of here. Despite the lackluster texture, the cauliflower is very well cooked. It's nicely tender, but it's not mush. And then we seasoned it with this amazing spice. If you can find it, get this. It's nicely spicy and salty and just overall delicious. And I really taste it in the cauliflower and it's very complimentary to the usual toastiness of roasted cauliflower. I'm gonna give the cauliflowers a seven. I think it tastes pretty great. It's not overly greasy, even though we fried it in duck fat. It's actually quite nice, but it's just a lot of work. I roasted the cauliflower, then I slurried it, and then I fried it, and then I drained it. It's just, I don't know if I would do it again. You give it a five? Right now, I feel like Julia in an episode of Julia Eats Everything. You want pork belly? Pork belly. Okay, cooked, June. Cooked until it's fallen apart, basically. It doesn't even feel like anything. This is just air. I feel like my grandfather's had way more shape to it and doesn't look like dog slop, but... Dog slop? Mm. We love dogs. The pork has turned so soft, it's just a creamy texture in your mouth. All of the richness has escaped into the broth, which has thickened with the potatoes, and it's just like a massive saucy stew. Even the cartilage in this is like not even hard to chew. You got a cartilage piece? Those are my favorite. Mmm. After that unfortunate vegetable break, we're back to uh, good food. What's your grape? Is this five spice? It's a homemade six spice. Six spice? That's one extra. <laughs> Then I have to bump it up one point for being one extra spice. So Ooh. I will give it a uh, 8.5 instead of a 7.5. That's pretty high. Mm -hmm. I'll give this an 8.5 too. Consensus. What do you want to eat next? We don't have much left, but I am already extremely full. How many people do you think this would serve? I, I don't know, like everyone. <laughs> <laughs> you okay? Did you die? <laughs> Food coma? <laughs> we forgot to try the crunchy black sticky rice that I fried. Oh my god. Oh my god. That bumps it up to a nine for the whole dish. Ooh, what vegetable would go oh. great with anise? I think tomato. Try a tomato. Does that work? Mmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Follow you. Michelin three-star chefs watching, and I know many of you watch June. Your next dish should be anise and tomato. Tomato tart 
with powdered anise in the pie crust. Is it anise? How do you pronounce it, YouTube? Comment below. Aaron, I got this local purple cauliflower, which you ate fried and you didn't like, but it's so crunchy and tender. It's so good. He doesn't like it. <laughs> Guys, I don't know if I can eat anymore. I'm approaching a critical level. I'm gonna eat the potato salad, just a bite. Don't you hate potato salad? Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. Mmm, try one. Mm. Try a bite. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. What are the little, so there's carrot, and then what are these? The white cubes? Carrots and apple. Oh. My mom always puts apple in it. Well, you didn't mention there was good food in this. <laughs> you know the only thing potatoes are good for? Um. Fries. What do you give this? I'm gonna pretend the potato isn't here. I'm okay. gonna say it's a uh, carrot apple salad and give it an eight. So Aaron, these Two. are these are gluten-free crackers. Actually not gluten-free, they have Surely sourdough. Surely these are store-bought. No. Of some kind because they look prof don't these look professional like something out of you're trying you know, too hard to sell it no i'm serious it actually looks like professional it, it looks like a packaged snack food mm -hmm. in a good way eat it these are meant to go with our fish but do you mm. like them hell yeah that's a good ass cracker i think so too ass cracker <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> do you want to try these fishies Decide which one's your favorite. Dude, I'm feeling it now. <laughs> it's my job. Either you come with me or you don't. Fish, 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 fish. All right, I'll try the tuna salad. Okay. Quality tuna salad. Pretty standard. I think I made things along similar lines. Mm-hmm. Smoked sprat. I'm gonna try the Panasonic fish. One other thing. Ooh. I made sure to buy all of the fish from different countries of origin. So mm -hmm. that we're getting a taste of different countries as we're going. I can't get this off my fork, so I'm gonna. That works. June, mm. tin fish is so good. You could have just done the whole meal, like. Oh, only tin fish, and I'd be super happy. Okay, can I get a combo score for the entire appetizer, including potato salad, almond crackers, almond multi seed crackers, tuna salad, and five canned fishes? Combo score. Yeah, this is a 10. <gasps> mm -hmm. For sure. Did you just say a 10? It's got a wide variety of flavors, textures. It showcases your chef skills with this fantastic thing. It, it awakens the palate. Mmm. That's what appetizers are supposed to do. Why did we eat this last? I'm serious. This is my favorite thing you've made so far. No. Yeah. This really? is my favorite thing of the meal. Julia, how do you do this? How do you do this every time? Mm. You want to do boosh? You want to do the boosh? What are you saying to me right now? Oh, sh God, that's so much food. <laughs> I thought this was just our desserts, and then I looked over and saw this gigantic <laughs> log. <laughs> Julia said she wanted a showpiece. This is like that's a... True. That's a real showpiece, yeah. It is beautiful, isn't it? No. Do you guys see how precarious this is? It's, we don't have a proper kitchen. Plate, please. Trying to get a piece of cake and mm. ganache. Mmm. 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 Mm. I don't want a pomegranate seed. Please try it. Grudgingly. Huh. What do you think? Great flavor. I wish the cake dough was a bit denser, mm. more like fudgy instead mm. of cakey, mm -hmm. but that's the style you made it, so mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. The flavor is great. Mm -hmm. The whipped cream is nice and light, not mm -hmm. too sweet. Mm -hmm. I like that it's more of like whipped cream and not a buttercream. Mm -hmm. Love the ganache. That's a peppermint ganache too, right? Is everything peppermint? Everything is peppermint, yes. Hell yeah. <laughs> I think I sure. killed. <laughs> I think I killed Aaron. Okay. <laughs> we still it's have cookies. A whole pile of cookies. There's a pile of cookies. Wait, you didn't roll. You didn't break the Yule log yet. It's you know it's food. I just uh, spent three days <laughs> making it, dude. <laughs> Maybe if I didn't eat eight courses before it, I would have appreciated it more. I don't normally like chocolate mint stuff, but this one is really nice. The whipped cream is super light 
super creamy and super bodacious because of that gelatin. It adds a layer of body to it. I mean, the chocolate ganache is amazing because Rocca chocolate is amazing. It's smooth, it's velvety, it melts just when you want it to and not before. And the cake is fine. The cassava flour worked out great. I love this. I love this. I'm gonna give this a 12 out of 10 for 12 days of Christmas. I don't know what Aaron wants. Christmas is one day, dummy. Do you have a grade for me or not? Uh, hey. Not bad, I'll take it. It's cookie time. Normally I would be ecstatic, but like, it is really uncomfortable to eat this much, guys. Even, uh, snowball, pumpkin spice. We got some citrus zest amaretti. We got some chocolate chip. They're all gluten-free. Oh free. my God. What? Can I have a bite? I don't want one. June? Mm. You made the perfect cookie for me. I know you don't call yourself a pastry chef. <laughs> But these are expert. I'm only gonna give the snowballs maybe like a 6.5. They're a little bit dry for me. I think I overbaked them. Plus, we were very experimental with it. I didn't really have ground nuts to put in it. And uh, what are you eating? Chocolate chip. You ate without me? Mm hmm. What do you think? It's so soft. This is like those Toll House, you know, chocolate chip fudge cookies or whatever. Mm -hmm. But they advertise on the box like the softest cookies you'll ever eat in your life. I think they're a little underbaked. Well, that's what makes them You like them? So fun. Yeah. They are underbaked. But that's that's part of it. It's mm. part of the deal. Are you going to go for a sugar amaretti or no sugar amaretti? I just got to say this is my plate right here. You know me too well. Other than, you know, like Middle Eastern pastries like baklava, this is my desserts on a plate right here. I cannot give this plate anything but a 100 out of 10. Holy schmoly! Mm -hmm. mm. It's like moist, light, but still yeah. super fulfilling. It's not like wafery or airy at all. It just turns into like gummy goodness. All right, out of those three cookies, which one is your favorite? It's impossible. Absolutely impossible to say. They could be sold in... The finest bakeries of Paris. How much would you pay for this plate? The whole plate? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's got to be a... I feel like it's a good two to three pounds. Yeah, at least ten trillion dollars. <laughs> Guys, I've lost track of time. I've lost track of what, what day of the week it is. I don't know who I am anymore, and I truly don't know what the best thing that I tasted here was. However, I will say that Bouche de Noël... I want to go back for more, even though my stomach has exploded inside of me. What do you think? The number one highlight of the whole meal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The great tomato. <laughs> Get out of here! <laughs> no, so the highlights for me, because they're so different and I can't pick just one. This was incredible. This, I can't say how much that impressed me. The duck, super tender. The glaze was amazing. And the pickles that went with the duck were perfect. The paudicchio was the best paudicchio I ever had. And just the best cheesy bread I've ever had in general. Cheesy bread. Cheesy bread. And then the desserts were like, you know, can I say, uh, No, you cannot. <laughs> can I say censored explodingly good? Uh-huh. <laughs> just, yeah, the whole meal was incredible. And it was eclectic. I think this was the most eclectic, weird, but in a good way. I love weird things. You're weird. That's why I like you. I just love weird things. This was a weird, fun, exciting meal. Yeah, this was fun. And I think this is the best Christmas slash actually mid-November <laughs> that I've ever had. <laughs> Guys, it has been a delight. I'm leaning on my cupboards because I will fall if I don't. I have no words. Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. I hope you're staying safe. I hope you're staying healthy. I hope you're staying sane. Look out for each other. Take care of each other. And stay hydrated. Even though those trucks are so noisy outside. See you next time. <laughs>